to Asheville, North Carolina and the Blue Ridge Assembly. The Black Hills were home to the Future of Families mandate for new initiatives, sponsored by the National Council of Family Relations for the UN International Year of the Family. The conference hosted representatives of over 30 countries from around the world. First, let's start with Belgium and Australia. I wanted to uh, say that, uh, that they're uh, familiar faces they put on the planning committee, so not only representing in different countries, but uh, for the United Kingdom. On Friday, Jan Hogan, conference chair, shared the goals of the workshop and introduced Henrik Sarkowski, Secretariat for the United Nations International Year of the Family. The workshop participants are challenged to search the globe for potential solutions to family issues. And the globe in some ways has come to us. There are many countries here and many of you have traveled and worked and have colleagues and lots of experiences. And so we'd like to think in that broader perspective. And we all have the opportunity to network with experienced family professionals from different parts of the world and to work on the action agenda for families that would lead to long-term collaboration. If you have questions about the workshop and its organization, the committee is listed in your program. And you can ask them. I think they've been involved in it for so many years that they probably uh, think that, that everyone knows exactly uh, you know, how this got planned and why it got planned. Uh, but the committee has worked on this through uh, long distance and all kinds of creative communication ways. Uh, and I think that's probably uh, been one of the real joys of, of being part of this. I'd like to take just a minute to introduce the committee. And if they would stand, um, at least you'll have an idea of some people you can talk about if you want to suggest any kind of changes. Is Shirley Walker here? Ah, Shirley, uh, from the University of Nebraska. Marilyn Benson. Marilyn is the UN NGO representative in New York. Uh, and Wilbur Duma, uh, who is from uh, Belgium. Um, John Eagle, from the University of Hawaii. And Kate Funder, from the Australian uh, Institute of Family Studies. And Masako Ishikuns, uh, she is around. Uh, she's from the University of California. Yoav Levy. Yoav is from the University of Papa in Israel. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to say that Edith Lewis uh, from the University of Michigan was unable to come. She is in Africa uh, on an international project as we speak. Um, Carol Maxuki. Carol is from uh, the British Columbia Council for the Family in Canada. Uh, Carol Morgan is Pacific University and is uh, from Oregon and is unable to be here. She, uh, has been very helpful and has changed positions um, just this month. Um, and Connie Steele, Connie from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and Jan Trost from uh, Sweden was also uh, unable to be here, and, uh, and all of the ones that are unable to be here send their greetings, and in some ways I'm certain uh, we'll uh, want to hear all about what happened, but wish that they could be here. Well, I'd like to turn... all kinds of ideas as we've gone along and has stuck with us over a period of several years, so it's, it's really uh, very appropriate that they receive the applause. I'd like to turn now to introduce Henry Swalowski, who is the coordinator of the International Year of the Family, 
And some of you may have, uh, obviously were introduced briefly to him earlier tonight, but some of you may have also had an opportunity to work with him since he has been the globe over in terms of a representative for the International Year of the Family. Prior to his appointment as the International Year of the Family Coordinator, he was Director of Social Development Division for the United Nations at Vienna. And prior to this posting, he was Deputy Director of the Department of International Organizations in Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The post he held from 1980 after his return from New York, where he represented Poland as the Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN. He has served in the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1960. This includes at least 17 sessions of the UN General Assembly. Prior to 1960, he served for the Council of Family Affairs and the Council of Ministries of Poland, the National Committee for the Child, and the National Committees for UNESCO and UNICEF. He's the author of numerous publications on international affairs. He's a graduate of the University of Warsaw, and postgraduate studies were completed at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. During this past year, he has traveled uh, to many countries. And he brings the message of family strengths and assemblies celebrating the UN Year of the Family. And he brings special insight into the issues and how we might attack them. We are very pleased to present you and have you give us an address. Thank you. are challenged by new forces of discrimination and brutal ethnic 
religious, social, cultural, and linguistic strife. As technological advances are altering the nature and expectations of life all over the globe, and the revolution in communications is uniting the world, the same signs of progress also signal new risks for societies, such as ecological damage and disruption of family and community life. At the same time, there is a real danger that these new and more visible threats and challenges obscure the devastating problems of growing disparity between the rich and the poor, unchecked population growth, abject poverty, disease and social exclusion that continue to afflict billions of human beings. The sources of conflict and threats to peace are numerous and diverse. For lasting peace to prevail, it must be solidly based on development and centered in its broadest sense on human rights and fundamental freedoms. This concept has been emphatically placed at the center of work of the United Nations in the Secretary General's recent Agenda for Development. It calls for a human-centered culture of development and recognizes peace economy, the environment, societal justice and democracy as integral elements of the drive towards development and a better world. It is precisely against the backdrop of such a global development perspective that I wish to perceive of the world's support for building the smallest democracy through the International Year of the Fund. In fact, such a perspective is tremendously important. The year is not an isolated effort taking place in a vacuum. It has been conceived and is being pursued in full harmony with the overall development efforts of the international community. It constitutes a significant measure towards human-centered, sustainable development. This intimacy and essentiality of IYF to the global processes become all the more striking in the context of the definition of human development as development of the people, for the people, by the people. Development of the people means investing in human capabilities, whether in education or health or skills, so that they can work productively and creatively. Development for the people means that the economic growth that they generate is distributed widely and fair. Development by the people is giving everyone a chance to participate and entails a reciprocal obligation on states to empower people in decision making. Families and the year offer a uniquely integrative platform cutting across sectors and population groups with people as first in development effort. Furthermore, we perceive of the IYF in the context of the various specific measures that the world community has embarked upon for social progress and development in the last few decades. It has been the declared objective of the IYF to build upon the international activities of the 70s and the 80s, which mainly focused on the individual, notably women, children, youth, the elderly, and persons with disabilities. The IYF also constitutes an essential link in a chain of global development initiatives of the 1990s, which collectively represent an unprecedented process of refining and defining the social edifice of the United Nations system and, by extension, the collective future of humanity. First was the Earth Summit, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, which served notice, which served notice that environment permeates all aspects of development that for sustainable development to succeed, it must become the concern and commitment of all segments of society. It must become the concern and commitment, including families, that in order to secure the future of our planet, all actors, including households, must change the way they behave. Thereafter was the Second World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna 
which once again enshrined the rights of the individual as the paramount value and cornerstone of development. Then in 1994, the International Year of the Family, when the family of nations pays tribute to families all over the world as the basic units of society. Sylvia Ann Hewlett, renowned author, shared perspectives of family policy in the United States and was welcomed by Linda Walters, chair of the International Year of the Family Committee for NCFR. Let me start with just a very small amount of time devoted to the kind of private baggage that I give to this subject because it's very silly to think that any of us coming from a variety of disciplines, are right, just kind of a bag of tools. <laughs> we also come with our private passions and our own biographies, which informs, I think, the values and the goals that we bring to this most intimate of subjects. As mentioned in the introduction, I grew up in a rather poor family in the Welsh mining valleys. The unemployment rate in my community when I grew up was 35%, and my father was in and out of work in my childhood. We didn't have a telephone, a car, or a television, but we were very rich in parental attention. And all six of us girls went on to become professionals and mothers. So I think that something went very right in my childhood despite the lack of kind of material goods. When I came to the US in the late 60s, I really felt one of the luckiest women on earth. I hit the right country at the right point in time. You just had to look around the professional landscape and you saw the barriers to achievement by women visibly falling all around you. I was on the crest of the new women's movement, part of those early struggles, and I really felt that as long as I worked hard, surely I could have it all. And what I meant by all was really a fulfillment in both love and work, something which after all men had taken for granted for generations. And I felt that I was part of this new generation that could have both family and a fulfilling career. And I did try and do a little planning. But despite the fact that I put all of these building blocks in place, you know, I delayed childbearing, I armed myself the teeth with advanced degrees, I found myself, myself a tremendously supportive husband. Nevertheless, when I had my first child in New York City in 1977, this very carefully constructed house of cards really did come tumbling down around my ears. The first problem was that my place of work Columbia University had no maternity or parenting leave policy. So I was expected to be back at work uh, 10 days after the cesarean. This is not easy, as you might imagine. And as is true of many women in this kind of situation, I ended up doing at least four things badly. I was a very medical professional, pretty lousy wife and mother, and I also flunked breastfeeding as I leaked milk all over everyone on the job. <laughs> but this is a fairly standard story in the late 70s. In fact, even today, about 40% of American women have no rights to anything when they give birth. No rights to time off, no rights to medical insurance. And so this is a fairly standard story. I did not feel I was being discriminated against. It was merely the cost of being an American woman in some way. So as was true for many of my cohort, I kind of blame myself. You know, my head wasn't in the right place. I should learn to get along with three and a half hours sleep a night, and then I too could become one of those glossy, you know, uh, Teflon-coated supermoms that the media seemed to be so full of. Two years later, when I lost twins in the seventh month of pregnancy, I finally figured it out. I became angry. I realized when my place of work gave me three days to recover from that double tragedy that I truly was living in a city and in a society where childbirth was seen as some kind of expensive private hobby that you did on your own time and children were seen 
as private consumption goods. They are under the window sill. She don't see us until we slam down the window and she break. She look with one eye. She don't die right away. We dip her in over and over in the water pot we boiled on the hot plate. We want to see how it be to die slow like our baby died. Brian was just nine years old when he dictated this poem. His baby sister had been found dead in their shelter about six weeks previously. When she died, tomorrow was 10 months old and weighed seven pounds. The death certificate cited parental neglect, a viral infection, malnutrition as the causal factors. In other words, it was an avoidable death in the richest city on earth. And if you look at the statistics in 1988, you will discover, as you probably already know, that that year some 40,000 American babies died before the age of one years old. Half of them unnecessarily. They did die from societal and family neglect. In fact, a child born in the shadow of the White House these days has a less good chance of living that first year of life than a child born in Costa Rica or Singapore. We, in this nation, have every reason to be thoroughly ashamed of what we are doing by and with our children. But, you know, before we run away with the idea that it's just children in homeless shelters that are somehow at risk in this society, one thing I really want to stress is that whether you're looking at the US or Australia or Britain or many of these rich democracies, it's not just children in the ghetto that are in bad shape. Children right across the socioeconomic class structure are suffering in new ways. Let's just look at some of the indicators out there. Teen suicide has tripled in the US and many of these other countries over the last 15 years. Obesity amongst teenagers has gone up about 40%. Father access is on the rise in huge ways. One of the most devastating figures out there was a figure actually turned out by a big study organized by the University of Pennsylvania in the early 90s. And it showed that in the wake of divorce, 43% of fathers never see their children again. And we all know the yawning holes that leaves in the lives of children. And 15 years after that kind of abandonment, many of those kids are in deep trouble on both the emotional, financial, and even cognitive fronts. I finished with one story that shows that this connection between child welfare also goes through to men's lives. Last uh, summer I was doing some work on paternity leave in uh, America, trying to figure out you know, who was taking it in the States, whether it made a real difference to the beginnings of life for children. And I started off doing a little work at the Ford Foundation in New York City. I chose the Ford Foundation because it has had paternity leave for 27 years. It's one of these real kind of leading heart liberal institutions that has always done very well on this kind of policy front. So I turned up at the Ford Foundation with a bunch of appointments, you know, intended to find out how it had worked. And I discovered that although they'd had this policy for 27 years, no man had ever taken it. In other words, the work ethos of New York City was so very brutal that as one of the young men said to me, you know, taking paternity leave was a little like having lace on your jockey shorts. You know, good American men just didn't do things like this. And I think that is a tremendously depressing statistic. Because it shows that unless we make these kinds of family-friendly policies truly legitimate and universal, 
We are not going to change that mentality out there, which puts the career struggle, the paycheck, the status in the workplace so far ahead of any consideration vis-a-vis -vis, you know, what is going on with that child. Because all, we all know that a little bonding at one week, six months, all the rest of it, can make a tremendous difference, not just in the life prospects of that baby, but in the coherence of that new family and the strength of that marriage. And in the wake of Clinton's family leave bill, the data is increasingly showing that less than 1% of the fathers newly able to take family leave are actually taking less than 1%. And I think that shows the ways in which we are denying men the possibility of truly balanced lives with both the joys and the responsibilities that come with hands-on parenting by our history of kind of mean-spirited third-rate policies that have denied legitimacy to family and to children. Participants worked in initiative teams throughout the workshop to develop policy, practice, research, and educational recommendations for 12 very important family issues. Those ranged from gender, family violence, health, aging, marriage and intimate relationships, family law and rights, immigrant and refugee families, to families in poverty, and child care and parental alternatives and participants learned while at play with the family puzzle developed for NCFR or the family visioning game. We have a um, interracial, multicultural family and we have them doing different things. They're working together, they're playing together and they are, um, uh, you'll see here a, a, a woman who is fishing and she is catching uh, the um, uh, greatest kind of fish available in uh, Australia, it's the peppermint fish. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see, it, this is an ecologically um, sound uh, place. You'll see that we have uh, a biosphere for growing our food and a place oh. for drying our food. Um, we have a place underneath for living in the earth. Uh, we don't quite have the earth around there, but you can imagine it. And then steps to get up to the lake area where the fish and the, the greenery and the plants grow. And um, can you pick up? <coughs> we, we have uh, very concerned to have our own power. So you can see we have our, our wind uh, power through our windmill. Uh, right next to it is where we collect the water when it rains about twice a year. <laughs> and we also, through our solar, solar power um, from the sun, uh, which we, we heat up. Uh, 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 you can see our whole power area there. Um, I think if anyone else wants to say anything. Well, we were planning that this would be the place for the conference next year. <laughs> Karen Noland from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, shared cultural values of Native Americans in the United States. Nursing. And among the Cheyenne, it was customary for a woman not to have relations again until the child was at least 10 years old. I would change tribes. I'd go next door and see if the crow had any openings. The human beings, the two-legged. Of the 30 million known species, insects, plants, other vertebrae, fungi, algae, fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, humans make up only three-tenths, three-tenths of one percent on Mother Earth. Yet, consider the tremendous impact this three-tenths of one percent the human beings have had on Mother Earth. I don't want to sound like an Indian Jerry Falwell. I tell you these things not to convert you or convince you, but rather to illuminate the possibility, the probability, that plants and animals and physical beings do indeed communicate and certainly have an essence, an important contributory reason for being. My ancestors said that only until one understood all this 
and fully incorporated this understanding into their being, would the world and life make any sense? May you all walk in balance. May you all dance to a different drum. We wish. We have um, a little gift for each family. It's uh, called Dreamcatcher. And this is an, uh, the one you're receiving, it's an Ojibwe dream catcher. It's meant to bring a good night's sleep. You hang it horizontally over a child's cradle, board, or crib. Tradition says that the air is filled with dreams, both good and bad, waiting to come to the sleeping child. The dream catcher's work, work is to sort out those dreams. For while the good dreams find their way to the child through the holes in the catcher's center, the bad dreams don't know the way, and they get hopelessly lost and tangled in the webbing where they will perish in the first light of dawn. So we have a tiny little Ojibwe dream catcher for each family. Thank you. Linda, Jan, and Mary Jo Chaplesky, executive director of NCFR, reflected on the conference and the accomplishments of the week. Uh, the issues that we were discussing, one of the things that's really been wonderful is because we have more than one country here, the issues are conceptualized differently in different countries. And as we try to understand each other, when we talk about those issues, we gain different insights about the issues as we face them in our own country. So not only do we have researchers and policy makers and practitioners here, we have those perspectives from different countries and it has made it a particularly rich way to think about the issues we're trying to think about here. We're fortunate in this field to have our own connections of family that we can bring and our insights from our own family experience uh, into our work. I know there's a danger sometimes of feeling that your own family has any uh, relevance to uh, the rest of the world, but uh, using the puzzle, it was really nice for people to connect with all of these different families, their selves and their own experience, and I like that. Our keynote speaker also was able to connect her life and her experiences with some of the issues facing families. It's a really a, a, a rare kind of insight people have from their experience. I think another thing that was really wonderful was the fact that we, so many people have brought their families with them and yeah. those families help to contribute uh, to the overall program here at Blue Ridge. I thought the evening that we played the family visioning game was just wonderful, very creative, and so we, we got some of the perspective of the actual families uh, in that particular game. I think that um, the use of the resource table and how the various countries contributed uh, their materials to that resource table was another way to, to integrate things very well. Uh, I thought the very fact that the families joined us in our meals and um, the children participated in the Billy Abel show, which was just a wonderful show to have money. And That's you know, Mary Jo, the, uh, talking about the children, the mural has been just wonderful. It's been uh, an opportunity for all of us to, to illustrate some of the things we're thinking. And it's the children who made it possible for us to do that because they were not inhibited at all about drawing on the mural. And it really helped some of us uh, feel freer to go ahead and uh, take part in that experience as well as the others. And it, provides a wonderful, very different kind of document of the nature, nature of the experience we had. One of the nice things about this workshop is we've worked hard, but we've also played fun. And it's really through the uh, kind of games and puzzles and mural, as well as the task force, and, and the very important recommendations. It's a nice mixture, and I hope that uh, people will find that, that play and work uh, sides of the, of the workshop is uh, a possible format for future workshops. On Sunday, participants joined in a circle to share about their conference and their hopes for the future, and to spend a few moments reflecting about their goals for the future of families. 
around the world. I hope that we all exceed our aspirations and our goals. And I hope we leave here by limited to experiencing aspirations and goals. And in order to make families for the ultimate better units in our dear world. I would like us to go back to our individual communities and as individuals begin to develop some community coalitions to have the same type of discussions that will allow us to be advocates with our local governmental um, representatives so that they know that we are there and that they need to listen to us when it comes to families. Especially if you want to grow the perspective from the policy perspective, look at how policy can increase the family. And that inspired me to go, when I graduate, I would like to go back to my country, Taiwan, and pay more attention to family policy regarding family, children, and women. And I think that's a great opportunity for me to be here. Thank you all. Art in the hands of the NCFR. Some of us just crossed across the state line to get to this meeting, but others have flown across many countries in far distances. And for whatever we brought to this, I found it very personally rewarding and especially thank those who came from such far distances to truly make it an international conference. And also I want to say how pleased I am to be in a profession that has such wonderful, wonderful people in it and to affirm each one of you for who you are.